here at the magnificent Belton House in Lincolnshire. But for once, we're not looking for some lost wing or digging up the ornamental gardens. About a century ago, there was another community in residence here. And they weren't the servants of the Brownlow family who owned the estate. For years, the army camped on the Brownlow's property, just beyond that run of trees over there. There were thousands of them. And during the First World War, they came here to learn how to operate something very modern and very lethal. Get your head down. If this was real, you are very, very dead, all right? We'll be uncovering the history of an elite force, the Machine Gun Corps, who underwent intensive training here at Belton, and their massive army camp that once covered this landscape. Less than 100 years ago, there's a whole town here, and it's gone. That's fairly impressive, isn't it? Gah! And rather heavy, too. We're going to turn the clock back 100 years and find out what happened when Belton went to war. And we've got just three days to do it. We're here at Belton to uncover the story of the Machine Gun Corps, a little-known section of the British Army who played a vital role in World War I, and to discover what's left of their training camp, which was dismantled lock, stock and barrel after the war. Francis Pryor is in charge, and he's spotted what he thinks is one of the very few imprints of a building on the site. Where are we going to dig first? I think the first trench is going to be over there in those stingy nettles. I think there's something really juicy over there. You see all these? He's deploying time teams Phil Harding and landscape archaeologist Stuart Ainsworth to investigate. And Stuart? Yeah? Francis reckons this is the right place to start. Do you buy that? Well, it is if we're looking for the YMCA, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, really. really. We know on this site there's a, a YMCA building. Yeah. And it's marked on this plan of 1960. There you are. YMCA. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good clue, isn't it? <laughs> Why would we want to look for the YMCA? Well, laying aside the fact it was the sort of social centre of the camp, more to the point, we know there is a building here. You can see earthworks. And we're going to go down and look what the evidence looks like in the ground. And that's what we don't <laughs> know at this stage. But what we do want to try and find is some evidence of the people that actually functioned in this yeah. building. Yeah. So the YMCA it is then? It is, Tony, and we better do it fast. Mm -hmm. The Young Men's Christian Association had a presence on most military camps in World War I. Back then, it would have been one of the few places where soldiers could go to get a break from the rigours of training. That might be it. There's a nail, there's bits of glass. I don't think we're going to need to take off much more than that, to be quite honest. We're looking for finds that'll help us reveal the story of the 170,000 elite soldiers who trained here to be machine gunners. Their story's partly lost because most of the machine gun corps' records were destroyed in a fire and in the Blitz in World War II. Our dig could help to put the gunners back on the map. Belton Park had been occupied by the army since the late 1890s, with the men housed in rows of tents. But in 1915, it underwent a transformation. Extensive infrastructure was put in, including a sewage works and a railway station. It even had electricity at a time when the majority of homes had none. With such a complex site, we've brought in military archaeologist Martin Brown to help us decide where to focus our efforts. So how does this all fit with what we know about the military? Yeah, well, each of these sort of pairs of, of rows here, these are barrack blocks, and in the middle of them you've got the wash houses, the ablution blocks, and their cook houses. There's officers' quarters to go with them, so that there's a very, you know, literally regimental stru regimented structure across the landscape. Um, but then, of course, there are the attendant features that support those. There's a, the Church of England room, Roman Catholic, and then up here, 
the YMCA hut, and that's where you can go, you can get a cup of tea, you can write a letter home, slightly outside the military structure, but still within the camp. So how long were people actually living this life in, in, in the camp? I mean, how long was their training? When the machine gun school's here, it's six weeks intensive specialist training. And, you know, that sounds like quite a long time, but what you have to remember is that you're taking people who've got very little experience of, of the specialist work they're doing, and at the end of it, they're meant to leave here and be able to go to the Western Front and win a war. I mean, why don't we go out and give his one of these blocks? <laughs> I'm glad you're saying one of these blocks because it's such an extensive complex and we can only sample part of that. Yeah. But if our survey takes in a variety of buildings, then hopefully we may get a better understanding how they were constructed, mm. what they were used mm. for. John's Jiffy's team sets to work. They're targeting a selection of buildings, including a barrack hut, a canteen, a washing block, and one of the camp's roads to see if there are any solid remains in the ground. So you've got the footprint of a building there, yeah. there, and there. John's results give us possible targets in two different types of building, one in a kitchen block and another in a barrack hut, enticing enough to open two more trenches. Cassie Newland is going to take on the barrack trench and there's some extra help from Martin Brown. He's unearthed photos from Belton House archive, which shows some of the huts under yeah, construction. Now, what's interesting is if you compare that to the photograph. They were clad with modern materials of the day, corrugated iron and asbestos sheeting. It just speaks of wartime emergency and throwing these camps up, doesn't it? With uh, yeah. you know the minimum <laughs> minimum frame and uh, cladding them in the asbestos. Yeah. But when you stand them against the tents, oh, they're massive palaces. improvement. Yeah. <laughs> So for anyone sitting over here, just out of shot, waiting for their home to be built, oh, yes. they must have looked very cosy. But what was it about the war which made building the hundreds of wooden huts at Belton so urgent? The answer was in the killing fields of the Western Front, where trench warfare was being transformed by the horrors of the machine gun. It had been invented 30 years earlier, but it was the Germans who'd realised its true potential. They created special machine gun companies who deployed their guns in concentrated groups. Our forces weren't so well prepared. Each infantry battalion had two machine guns, but these were spread out thinly across the entire front. We were outgunned, our men being slaughtered. So in October 1915, a year into the war, the unprecedented decision was taken to form a new force. The Machine Gun Corps was born. It needed somewhere to train and fast. Belton came into its own. It was a vast site that the army was already using for training and was easily adapted for the new Machine Gun Corps. Back at the YMCA trench, Phil hasn't found any of the building's structure, so he's extended the trench. Now the ground contains more debris, including loads of white pottery, and one piece leaves us in no doubt we're in the right place. <laughs> what you got there, Trace? Well, we're in a YMCA. And there you go, YMCA. Look at that. This isn't going to be your normal time team with lots of deep trenches. The archaeology is so near the surface here that these are going to be more like scrapings. Martin. What have we scraped up so far? Well, some really rather nice stuff. Um, there's a whole range of finds here. Um, but this, this is really lovely. Look at that. W Adams and Company, 1915 date on it, and the W in the lozenge, War Department contract. Perfect piece of dating material, Absolutely, that, isn't, isn't it? it? This is actually my favourite. You've got three little pieces of pottery. What could that word possibly be? What could that word be? It's Horlix. It's cold, it's wet, it's miserable. You've been out all day doing training. Actually, if you go up to the YMCA hut or the Church Army hut, there's probably a, a nice local lady who will serve you a warming mug of Horlix as a, as a bit of comfort. Pint of beer from the uh, YMCA, anybody? <laughs> Now, I've seen That's these nice. before on other campsites. I've got a theory about these pink mugs. The army 
try to keep the camps relatively alcohol free. So what I suspect they're using these pink mugs for in places like the YMCA is to serve pints of cocoa. And in a pink mug? Yes, because if the soldiers pinch them and take them back to the barracks, you can do an inspection and you can spot them straight away. If you tried that, you might not look so rough in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy you a pint of cocoa in the pub later oh, on. Oh, what? <laughs> A kilometre from the YMCA at the Barrack Hut, the photograph showing the construction of the site reveals chimney pipes on the exterior of each of the buildings. These match where Geofiz picked up a solid structure just inside the wall of Cass's Barrack Hut, where now something's coming up. Do you know what I think it is? You know, fire clay when you're making connections between stoves and flues and yeah. things like that. I think it's, fly, it's, for, it's a fire clay yes. yeah. join. So I think what we do have is whatever's left of that stove just dropped through the floor. Yeah. Um, it's sat directly on just a big pile of asbestos, really. Yeah, stove's a valuable item that you can reuse somewhere else, whereas exactly. bits of broken asbestos ain't. Yeah. So, do you want to just clean back the last of it and then we'll get in and tidy and see what's going on? The asbestos could be from the stove surround. And while it's damp, it's not a danger to the diggers. But those who built the camp in 1915 would have had no idea it was dangerous. Across the road at the cookhouse trench, they found a drain and a water pipe, which is surprising because even the pipework was supposed to have been removed in the cleanup which took place after the camp was decommissioned. The thorough cleanup of the site and the fact we're dealing with buildings that don't seem to have solid foundations is proving frustrating for Matt. There's no indication at all of any ground surface or any, or any the level that the building would have been on, so it's not looking good for finding the buildings. I'm getting a strong impression that these buildings were all raised. Right. You know, if you look at the photographs very carefully, you can see that they are actually raised on, on, on short wooden posts. So I think, archaeologically, this is, this is a nightmare, frankly. If all the buildings are wooden and built above ground, it's questionable how much more geophys can do. But John hasn't given up yet. With a site that's a mile wide, there's still hope that some of the buildings may have solid foundations. The archives of the Machine Gun Corps may have been lost, but our presence here has already attracted people who've been turning up with photos and documents that are adding to our understanding of the camp. This is rather nice, lads. Hot off the press. We've just been given this by a local resident. Oh, wow. YMCA, number two hut, Belton Park. That is incredible. Ooh, I mean, that, how often do you actually see in a photograph an, a, an image of a, of a building you could be looking at in the ground? Some of those, those objects in that photograph, who knows, they could be some of these objects in the tray. Yeah. We know that these come from the YMCA building. Yeah. What is most incredible is this piece here. This is absolutely unique. I mean, it, it is the reason that we've come here. Look, machine gun core. It's even got crossed machine guns, hasn't it? Like you would get crossed sword. So we've had a great first day. The stuff that's been coming up has been fantastic. Here in our first trench, we know where we are the YMCA, and we know who we're here, the Machine Gun Corps. Who knows what we'll find tomorrow? Beginning of day two here at Belton Park in Lincolnshire, and the good news is the sun's shining. But the bad news is that the World War I machine gunnery training camp that we've been looking for is proving surprisingly hard to find, which is odd, given that it's only about 100 years old. But the word the archaeologists were using yesterday was ephemeral. In other words, most of the buildings were made of wood. But yesterday evening, John came up with this geophys, which seems to show something much more robust down here. Francis, what do you think that might be? Well, we're actually over one of the kitchen blocks. Several buildings 
all about food preparation and actually eating meals. But what's fascinating is that the geophys shows a mass of blobs. You know, there's a lot of archaeology there. So where do we put the trench in? Um, I'm going to put the first trench in over there, which will be on the corner of that building there. Um, and I'm putting quite a big trench, about a five-metre square one. There were more than a dozen of these kitchen blocks across the site, and each would have been making meals for a thousand men. This was an industrial scale operation for machine gunners about to play a part in Europe's first industrial scale war. Right across the site, finds have been coming from just below the surface, and Matt and Rakshar's new trench is no different. So we're Aha. going for. Unfortunately, there's no, uh, there's no design on it. There's nothing on the base, is there? No, unfortunately not. It's pretty clean. That white glaze is all over the place. Well, it's not bad for the first few swings of the bucket, is it? No, it's not bad <laughs> at all. And well spotted, Rex. Right? This is the Vickers machine gun. There's not been one here at Belton for 90 years since World War I. It was much loved by the gunners because it was reliable. So good that there were some still in service in the 1960s. We want to understand how this powerful weapon revolutionised the British Army's approach to the war. To help us, we've called in military historian Andy Robertshaw. Is this gun real? This is the real thing. This is a, a, a Vickers machine gun. What we're going to do is set it up um, actually on its tripod here. Yep. That barrel assembly sits on that tripod. And this is something that they would have been doing here on a regular basis you know, during the war as they learnt to be machine gunners. What's so special about the machine gun? What's special is that this really is a full machine gun rather than something like the, the Gatling gun, you know, where you've got to crank a handle at the side. Yeah. That depends upon you actually you putting your arm and turning it round. This thing, what it does is it uses the energy from the bullet on the way out to reload itself. How does it do that? Well, if you can imagine, you've got a belt of bullets going into it, and then when you fire the weapon, what then will happen is that the bullet will go towards the target, yeah. you know, up to about three kilometres, but then all the working parts are thrown back, and as long as you're holding the safety catch and trigger, it'll continue to cycle through. It'll fire itself, even though you're doing nothing, as long as you're holding the safety catch and trigger together. This implies that we're actually going to fire it? Yes. We really are? We really are. Back at the trenches, the archaeologists are determined to find something left behind after the 1922 clean-up operation when the camp was closed down. First thing this morning, Rakshar and Matt made a good start in the kitchen trench with an early find, but there's been nothing on the finds front since. In our first trench, though, the YMCA is continuing to produce find after find. As one of the few non-military organisations on the camp, the YMCA would have been a focal point for the young gunners when off duty. Andy, we're getting some really lovely sort of objects of the social side yeah. of the, the soldiers at the camp, but I rather suspect we've also got military objects here as well. How about that? Um, well, that, that speaks of, of people training and firing. Uh, this is uh, a British round, 303. It's been fired, I think. I mean, is that the sort of cartridge you'd expect from a, a machine gun? Could be a machine gun, could be a rifle. They, they are the same here, um, so it's difficult to tell, really. But nonetheless, it's, it speaks of training. And that is very, very nice. That's the end of a swagger stick. It's a stick about, about that long, with a little ferrule on one end. And this end would have been shiny, either copper or silvered. Um, and it's designed so that when a soldier is walking out, going out into town, he doesn't put his hands in his pockets. And basically, you're encouraged to buy those. Fairly cheap, you know, piece of stick, little ferrule on one end, and you just walk it around in your hands. The nearby town of Grantham would have been transformed by the presence of thousands of young soldiers. St Wolfram's Church is one of the only places where the men of the Machine Gun Corps are remembered. With the loss of most of the records, it's up to the gunners' descendants to keep alive the memory of the sacrifice they made in World War I. 
One such soldier is Charles Pashler, who trained at Belton. In March 1917, he was posted to France on the Western Front. Four months later, near Arras, he was killed by a shell. His possessions were gathered up and returned to his widow in a bag, which his grandson Bill has brought in. What was in the bag then? Well, uh, several things really. The first thing, which was very personal, was his pipe. Well chewed, slightly battered around the bowl. What must it have been like for his widow? It, you know, he would have had it with him when he left the house and he wasn't coming back, but this had. That's right. Possibly, to my mind, the most poignant of the lot was the diary that actually was on his oh, body, look at that. of course. And inside the diary are the names of a lot of the men he trained with and even the hut numbers in Belton Park. The last entry, yes. 23rd of July, went into line. Yes. And that's it. And but the reverse of the diary itself is something particularly poignant. That there looks significantly like blood stains where there's a shell fragment or a fragment of metal that's penetrated the diary. And it was a tiny fragment. Yes. But the fact there's blood on it Yes. This, again, one wonders what my grandmother thought when she received all these that had... And she would have perhaps flicked through it and found that? She would. He had three little girls and she had to bring them up alone. Yeah. Yeah. For seven years from 1915, the sound of machine guns reverberated around this park. And to understand the role of Belton Camp, you have to understand how battlefield tactics changed because of the machine gun, and why such a huge effort was being made here to train specialist soldiers. Really is. Andy. Hi. So that's it. You're actually going to fire it. That's the idea. Just such an amazing thing to actually see that. I mean, my grandfather went through the entire First World War. Yeah. I know he wasn't in the machine gun corps, but he would have heard that weapon. And that hasn't been heard around here for a few years, has it? We'll be firing blanks, but don't want to spread panic among the golfers 2,000 metres away. Attention all golfers. Be aware we are about to fire a machine gun. Thanks. That's fine. Until Andy pressed that trigger, this Vickers machine gun hadn't been fired for over 70 years. Andy, it was quite incredible. It was, wasn't it? I mean, let's say we've got those uh, golfers down there. I mean, they would be... they would be dead. If we wanted to get them, we could have gotten no problems at all, and running wouldn't have helped. Just beggar's belief, doesn't it? What would have been going through somebody's mind knowing they had to clamber out of a trench walk across open country into literally what was, well, a hail of bullets, a wall of death. It's just a matter of luck, you know, whether you make it or not, you know, you just that question, will you get to the other side? By 1916, the British Army had made up for lost time and the machine gun crews who trained here at Belton were matching up to the German machine gunners. At the Barrack Hut Trench, where yesterday Cassie discovered asbestos, she's continuing to dice with danger. With Time Team's newest recruit, Rob Hedge, she's found another bullet, which amazingly still has its explosive charge. Lovely. Partridge and lots and lots of yummy-looking spaghetti. Spaghetti cordite is a nice explosive charge. Send the bullet out to kill people. Yes. I'm just having a look. Can't see any stamp on that. Can no, you? very plain. It's quite badly corroded, but it is definitely unfired. Hence the cordite. Hence the cordite. <laughs> <laughs> when the machine gun training was at its most intense here, they could easily have been firing a million rounds a week. But we found just two bullets. 
there must be a huge area we haven't found yet that's littered with them. Which means so far, we've only got half the story. What seems really important is to find out where people actually trained to fire the machine guns, because it was these things which were the whole reason for the existence of Belton Park Camp. We're here at Belton Park in Lincolnshire looking for an old World War I training camp where they used to teach the guys how to fire machine guns. But the archaeology is really ephemeral. Raksha, what have you got in this trench? Well, we've drawn a blank. Again, there is nothing in this trench. You see what I mean? But all may not yet be lost because they did an extension to the trench. And can you see where this brushing's going on? It looks like we may have the beginnings of a wall. Meanwhile, over on the rest of the site, you can see how enormous it is. The rest of the archaeologists are looking for bullets. And there should be millions of them, but only if we can find where the machine guns were fired. Francis has given that task to Stuart. If you look at the map of the camp, what it shows in this position here yeah. is a rifle range. There's just this one thing here, about 50 yards long. But, I mean, it, it's ludicrously small, isn't it? I mean, it's absolutely yeah. tiny. I mean, I wouldn't have thought you'd be you're shooting off you know, pea shoot. Mm. So, presumably, the main machine gun ranges have got to be away from the camp. I think so. And there's no indication on any of these maps that's machine gun areas yeah. in here. I think you've got to be somewhere out in the countryside around this camp to be doing proper machine gun training. While Stuart goes off searching for the training ground, Francis is still hoping to find more evidence of the hundreds of buildings where the gunners lived. Earlier in the day, we opened a trench over what we believe is a kitchen block, where it looks like there could be a structure below the ground. Rakshar and Matt have made some finds that take us right back to the early days of World War I. Look at this. <laughs> this actually has the date on it, 1914. Yep. So, <laughs> that's pretty bang on the money, I yeah. think. <laughs> you don't need a pottery specialist for that, do you? <laughs> no, but something that's really, really interesting that's come out of this pit is this pipe. That's, is that part of a clay tobacco pipe? It is. Because uh, whenever I think of the First World War soldiers now, I always think of, you know, cigarettes, hand-rolled cigarettes. You're right, but you're also wrong, because this is something called a cadger pipe, and we know that because it's much thicker, the stem's thicker, and the, this bowl would have been massive and very ostentatiously de uh, decorated. But these were still smoked during the First World War, so it is possible that maybe an officer was smoking a very highly decorative mm. pipe. You can just imagine it, can't you? <laughs> Our military historian Andy Robertshaw has always fancied the role of officer in charge, and now he has his chance. He's conscripted a squad of local archaeologists, and he's going to put them through some of the training of a World War I machine gun crew. That'll do, I think. The machine gun corps trainees were the cream of the army's recruits. They needed to be good at maths and had to be mechanically minded, but tough enough to construct defences for the machine guns and their crew of six. What's going on, Andy? I didn't know we were putting in another trench. Uh, we're not doing another trench for exploration. This is experimentation. Here, they're trying out the techniques that we used in 1915 to build a machine gun position. We've actually got a drawing which was done by somebody in the camp. And this is what you're recreating? That's the idea. What we've got then is a, a plinth where we'll put the machine gun, we'll yeah. put that in there later on. And what that allows us to do then is have it firing down the valley that way, or if the Germans come from a sort, of, sort of your right, my left, we can swing it round and fire down the valley as well. Are so you going to be able to rig that up in the day and a half that we've got left? We hope so, but we do have some experts with us. Uh, John? John? Can I borrow you? This is John. John's grandfather was actually here doing the same job. He was trained in the camp, wasn't he? He was. I have time for a photograph. Let's have a look. Which one's he, then? This gentleman sat here behind the vicars. And when was he here? February 16. 
Oh, great. So, oh, this is a real family thing, isn't it? It is, it is. isn't it? And what you may do is just leave it all to John, because he's obviously the expert. He obviously <laughs> runs in the family, you know. Well, as long as you can get it done before the end of tomorrow, we'll all oh. be happy. Uh, we hope so. Uh, yeah. Team, lads, Yay. lads, let's just yeah. crack on. We've got to <laughs> keep going, that's clear. Yeah. All right? Stewart's piecing together clues from reports of the machine gun firing ranges. There are a couple of place names on these documents that seem to be relevant. Alma Woods and Peascliff. We've got a few clues as to where they might be. Uh, the name Peascliff is mentioned a lot, where the golf club is over there, yeah. and Alma Wood over there is mentioned. So we've got at least two clues which I can go and have a look and see if anything survives. How can you identify them from the air? Well, what we should be looking for is a... Is a is a great big bank which is used to stop the bullet. It's a, a big earthen bank. Well, good luck. Yeah, thanks very much. Dense tree cover at Alma Woods rules out any observation there. So Stuart heads over a railway line which disappears into a tunnel. On the map, it's marked as Peascliff Tunnel. It's the adjacent golf course where Stuart turns his attention. This landscape is a challenge. But amongst the man-made bunkers and greens, he spots a much larger landform obscured by trees. Only further investigations on the ground will confirm whether or not this is part of the lost Peascliff firing range. That's good. Good, OK. Back on the site, Andy's squad of trench diggers are attempting to build a machine gun emplacement from where the gun can be fired. This is exactly what John Goree's granddad would have been doing before he went off to the front. John, it was your granddad who was here, wasn't he? It was, yeah, yeah. So he was doing this kind of job? Yes, well, we assume he was, but unfortunately he never told, so... No, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> never gave his opinions on how to build the better trench positions. No, you know, no or his experiences of it, unfortunately, so... Yeah, you, never at all? No. No. Wouldn't talk to anybody about any aspect at all. It was like so many of them. Yeah, that's the way things were, unfortunately, wasn't it? So their way of dealing with it and helping other people deal with it. Yeah. They only have a day left to finish it, ready for the firing of the machine gun. While our archaeologists still have the small matter of the lost firing range and buildings to contend with. But it's the end of day two and everyone's off to our makeshift machine gunner's arms. <laughs> Been a <laughs> <laughs> Nearby Grantham may be famous for producing the first woman Prime Minister, but there's another famous local woman who had to contend with the realities of thousands of soldiers here. The most interesting strong woman, in my opinion, is Edith Smith. And she was the head of the first women's uh, branch of the police force set up in Grantham, first one anywhere that were allowed to arrest people. And her express job was to hang around outside Belton camp, picking up ladies of the night, shall we say, so that they didn't come and interfere with machine gunners. You know that we said that we thought one of the most important things to find would be the place where the guys practice firing their machine guns. Well, Stuart's been up in the helicopter this afternoon and he thinks he's got the answer. Has he? We'll find out tomorrow. It's our last day at Belton Park and we've got just eight hours left to complete our investigation of the training camp where over 170,000 men were trained during World War I. But when the camp was closed in 1922, the site was thoroughly cleared. Finding anything significant in the ground has been a big challenge for our diggers. At the Barrack Hut trench we opened on day one, we've uncovered the edge of the camp's main road. In the ground, we found the remains of a wooden structure. Our first thought was that this was a sill beam, which is a beam set in the ground acting as a foundation for the Barrack Hut. But it turned out to be a wooden gutter. Now, though, Martin Brown believes the hut was set a metre further back from the road. Good. Yes, I think we've got something structural for you. Go on. What that looks like is a timber-lined gutter just at the side of the road. What we've got in here is just this dark stain. 
there, and that's the ghost of the sill beam. It is all very tenuous, though, isn't it? Oh, is this a sill beam? No, it's a drain. Is this a sill beam? We don't know. Well, not really, Tony. I mean, if that was on an Anglo-Saxon site, you'd be in no doubt. That would be a sill beam. It is frustrating, isn't it? <laughs> but isn't the great thing about this, you know, less than 100 years ago, there's a whole town here, and it's gone. Yeah. And that, the road, and just these very ephemeral traces, that's all we've got left of it. We're struggling to find any of the barrack huts, but luckily we can still see one of them today. After the war, when the Belton camp was closed, building materials were in short supply, so many of the huts were recycled, and some even taken down and reassembled. Martin and Cassie have gone off-site to the nearby village of Denton, where for the last 90 years, one of Belton's huts has been the village hall. Thank you. Oh, no, this is great. Oh, isn't that nice? Yeah. That's perfect. You can really sort of see sort of the layout of the whole thing now, can't you? Because it would be bunks down the edges. Yeah, you imagine coming in, the beds on either side, mess tables centrally down the middle, which they, they use for, for eating. And, and actually, we've got a picture here that gives you a fair idea of what one of these would have looked like. That's amazing, isn't it? It could actually just be this hut. It could, yeah. And the beds are clever because they, they slide back to create space in the middle. It's a bit like a sort of modern futon. You know, you look at this, you just imagine the smell of damp soldiers, wood binds and machine gun oil, and, and you're there. <laughs> Fantastic. The machine gunners who lived here were part of an elite force vital to the war effort. Theirs was such a high-risk job that unofficially they were known as the Suicide Club. On the Western Front, the machine gun units were often called upon to hold off the enemy so that others could retreat to safety. Local hero Second Lieutenant Graham Musson met his end doing just that at the Somme. Having stayed at his gun until the very last moment, he was shot in the back as he tried to rejoin his comrades. Where he's buried, no one knows. Graham trained at Belton, so his descendants have come here to share their story with Phil. My, my grandfather was at Passchendaele too. Right. You know, it's one of those things that yes. every, everybody knows somebody yes. who was yes. Yes. in the First World yes. War on the Western yeah. Front. And actually, it was, we were quite lucky. Edith, his sister, gave me this letter. And it's obviously a treasured letter she'd kept. So I felt quite honoured to be given it. This physically came from the front? Yes. This is what? Yes, it's got fronts there on the top. Think of the happy times we have been privileged to have in the past. So face the future with a courage based on the thoughts of these. I always have believed that our destinies are mated out by God. And wherever we are, when our time comes, we have to go. So there is no greater peril for me here than elsewhere. It's a very sort of eloquent way of... It is, yes. ..and a very philosophical approach to the dangers that he was obviously facing. Yes. Mm. It's a very cruel way to go. No. I mean, if he would have been shot mm. at his guns, yeah. that's one thing. But to be withdrawn, <coughs> it's uh, it's not really fair, is it? <laughs> Graham's stoical bravery and sacrifice won him no special medals. Like so many others, he was just doing his duty. Yesterday. By combining information from documents, maps, and observations made from the air, Stuart came up with some ideas as to the whereabouts of the firing ranges. Now, Francis has deployed a crack team to the nearby golf course to settle once and for all the mystery of one of the lost firing ranges of the machine gun corps. Seeing this, I was staggered when I saw it from the air. And I came, I came straight down and I had a look at this thing this morning and um, went into this and thought, magic, this and, is what we've been looking for. And this magic staggering thing? It is a big bank hidden in those woods. 
with a ditch in front of it and there's lots of things to see once we get round that corner over there. So I'm we're always wary of things on golf courses. <laughs> this isn't a golf course. Thing. I'm pretty sure right. this, this isn't some hazard created round the other. This is the... The locals who've helped us with our investigation have come up trumps again with an astounding piece of evidence. This picture's absolutely fantastic. It's taken from somewhere just a little bit up from where we're standing. I reckon Les out there is more or less where these guys are now. Yeah. And the sort of muddy ditch in front of us actually is really quite a substantial deep excavation. But you can be absolutely certain that this is our range and that is taken during the First World War. Definitely First World War. Bell tents in the background, what the people are wearing, that all fits. And the mechanism is absolutely right as well. All this pulley arrangement all looks a bit Heath Robinson, but it'll raise the targets up, you fire at them, you drop them back down again, you can see how the guys are doing. <laughs> He's getting excited by gadgets. <laughs> I get excited by these great big earthworks, Phil, and I know you get excited by fine, so let's have a look. Hand it up, John and Richard, and we'll get that in place. Back on site, and his recruits are getting a taste of what it would have been like to be a trainee gunner. Okay. Go on, get your head down. If this is real, you are very, very dead, all right? And it was the training officer's job to push the men to the limit. Undercover. Get low, get low, get low. Pass it up and then get it over there, all right? Is that in place? Ammunition, come in. What they learned here would Brand give them a fighting chance at the front. All right, either of those drop, pull them out of the way and replace them in a the firing position. Crikey, Andy. I feel scared, you know. <laughs> well, I suppose it's, it's as real as we can make it. You it, know? it. It really is. You can just imagine. Yeah. I and mean, you're fairly safe here, low. Yeah. Up on the surface where you are, dangerous. OK, I'm off. <laughs> Francis makes a hasty retreat to the safety of the kitchen trench. After two days of digging, we're finally making sense of one of the very few structures we've uncovered here. We've been thinking about this concrete thing here as being a drain, haven't we, in a yeah. cookhouse. But actually, this concrete thing lines up pretty well with one of the hut walls. So that concrete is the foundations, and then there'd be blocks or bricks to form the, the main part of the hut here. So this is the first time, and it's on the 59th minute of day three, <laughs> that we have got a surefire hut wall with cinders on the inside, so that's showing that that's probably floor, yeah. coming up to the wall and not going outside. I mean, I'm really excited about that. This is a 100% genuine hut wall, and I'm exhausted. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> At last, a building. And on the golf course, hidden in the trees, is a ditch behind which there's a raised bank. Here, Stuart's hunting party are in the rough, looking for more evidence of the firing range. Oh, yeah. That was quite interesting. Yeah. So is this where the targets would have been, down in this uh, hollow here? Yeah, cos then you've, you've got the guys who are working them are out of danger from yeah. incoming fire, and the targets get usually get raised up, fired out, lowered down again to get your scores. And so the bullets really... are coming straight up here. Yeah, yeah, just straight down from, yeah. From about, from about 600 yards away down there. And this is designed to stop them, basically. <laughs> and when you think about it, millions of bullets must have hit this bank <laughs> over the course of the year's training here. So we've got to get out. Wait! <laughs> you got one? I've oh, got two! Look, ah, look. There you go. There's one there, yeah. one there, and another one there. Oh, and another one. <laughs> Having been embedded in the bank all those years ago, erosion has finally exposed them. They're all in here. Over there as well. What I look, what up there? Some over here. One there. So what, um, what calibre are these, Martin? Well, they look like .303, which is the standard calibre for the for the Vickers yeah. and for the Lee Enfield rifles. I tell you what, you talk about solid and they're heavy. <laughs> yeah. And they're heavy. Oh yeah, I mean that's not gonna do you a lot of good if I throw it at you, let alone <laughs> travelling at sort of the speed of sound. The firing range was enormous. Wide enough for as many as 20 machine guns to be firing at once. The sound of the guns would have been heard a mile away at the Belton Army camp. 
and for long range firing of over 600 metres, they had to close the road so that the gunners could fire over it. Our dig has revealed that of the hundreds of buildings, few had foundations, and all of them were built in a hurry in response to a crisis on the battlefield. Yet after the war, just seven years after the Machine Gun Corps was formed, the elite force was disbanded. The Belton camp was no longer needed, and so piece by piece, it was dismantled. There's another dimension to what we've achieved. The dig has brought together people from the locality and beyond, each of them adding something to the history of the Machine Gun Corps. It's been quite a tough few days, hasn't it? It has, Tony. It's been very challenging indeed. I mean, I think the finds that we've revealed in the excavations have brought the lives of the men who served here to life. But I think our real legacy will be that we have actually put the Machine Gun Corps on the map. I think it really is important that we should remember them because of the 170,000 men who trained here, over 12,000 went to war and never came back again. And it's in memory of them that Phil's now going to fire a final salute. OK, John, ready when you are. Gun ready. Five past seven for Channel 4 News tonight. But for unique insight on the day's big stories, whenever you want, sign up to Snowmail at channel4.com slash snowmail. A funny movie next on 4 with an eco-friendly message, so educational to boot. Brendan Fraser stars in Furry Vengeance.